this is one of the things I like hold close to my chest and I use as I would say a cheat code for life because when I used to play video games I used to look up cheat codes this is my cheat code Brian Mark welcome to the game quiz dude thanks for having me this is fucking dope here we are in Koh Samui Thailand who would have ever thought Dude, it's funny it is funny thinking about it and the villa is beautiful um yeah it's, it's been 12 years i think it's like 10 10 12 years since i've seen you last yeah and you know for people who don't know we originally met in calgary alberta canada which is where we're from yeah and now we have two canadian boys out here in thailand yeah enjoying the weather enjoying the scenery and just the nature that it really provides and we originally met through social dynamics yeah now I think one thing that really brought us together, you know, seeing us now, like it's been 10, 12 years since we've seen each other. And it's been amazing for me to kind of witness all the growth that you've had and where you've kind of come to. Mm. And obviously I've been able to kind of reach a certain level in my life as well. But to go back and understand like where we came from. Yeah. That's been a special thing to be reflecting on this week. Yeah, I think that like for people that are like, um, that don't know my story, like I, started out back in Calgary and Cam was my first ever mentor. Um, before Cam, I was partying, drinking. I just quit playing video games and smoking weed all day when I had met you. And I was just starting to take my life seriously, which was why I was like into these like personal development forums and like trying to figure out like who I could connect with that was like doing different things. And then I came across you and like, yeah, you're one of my first ever mentors. And I think that's really the, the beginning of where our journey started, which was we both kind of reached a point where we realized we were sick and tired of not living the life that we thought maybe we could. Yeah. You know, and, and we were talking about this a bit yesterday, which is like, you know, you mentioned you wanted to stop feeling like a loser. Yeah. And I, I think that's so much of my story too, for people, you know, who maybe know it or don't, you know, I was gaming 16 hours a day. I was very depressed. I was super anxious. I was mm. pretending to have jobs. I was sneaking in through my bedroom window, you know, deceiving my family. Yeah. And, you know, eventually I wrote, a suicide note and that's really the night when i realized i need to make a change and there was a decision that night and it was that if i wasn't going to end my life i was going to do the complete opposite mm. which was to truly try to live my life to the fullest yeah and it came from this place of like curiosity what could i achieve yeah if i actually was successful and and in the event that i was mm. then i should start today yeah because then i can see just how far i can go and yeah. so for me like after a couple of years i met you and one of my first goals was like to improve my social skills and, and start meeting people and just like improve that area of my life. Yeah. But now looking back, you know, 12, 13, 14 years later, it's been, I would have never imagined that this is where it would go to. Yeah, I, th I think that like, when I think back to like 12 years ago, like even when we first met, um, I was at a place in my life where like I, all I knew, it was actually, I think 14 years ago, cause I was 19 and I'm 30, I'm turning 33 this year. All I knew at the time is that I got a job as a bartender because I wanted to do something where I could take my work and travel. So I got a job bartending and I was partying every weekend and I wasn't going to go to university because I, I thought I was going to be a pro football player. That dream went down the tank. So I was like, I don't really know what I want to do. And so at 19 years old, I was just kind of like lost looking for direction. And, um, and then I joined this like community that you owned. I didn't know you owned it at the time. I joined a community that you owned, found out who you were. You were running this like thing that was like helping people with social dynamics. I thought that was sick. So I was like, I want to do that. And I'm like, I was already interested in personal development. I just didn't know where to go or like who to turn to or who else was on the journey. I just knew I wanted to improve my own life. Um, and like, that's where, that's where this originated, I feel like. And why were you so drawn to personal development in the first place? Like, you know, obviously there's some skeptics out there about personal development. People who are like, ah, like who cares? Like, why is it that important? Like, yeah. why do you read these self-help books? Like, does it even really help? Does it really matter? Like, why not just live life the way, you know, life is meant to be lived? Yeah. Why were you so drawn to that concept? Um, dude, it comes from my background. So like my growing up, like, you know, I was in church, like my, my family's very religious. And so we'd go to church and at the church, we were the family that didn't have money. And so we were the family that other families were like donating their clothes to. Like we were the family that like got me hand-me-downs. We were the family that was like the charity family. Um, 
my grandma works super hard, my grand, grandpa works super hard, but they worked minimum wage jobs their whole life. Um, everyone in my family struggled with weight issues, and I remember, it's funny because when you actually think about like where transformation starts to happen, often it's like these like little moments, but it was like, I remember I asked this girl out when I was 13 years old, and I was like overweight, struggling, whatever. I asked this girl out in front of my two best friends, and at the time, like I was like really overweight, and I was like, do you wanna like go swimming with me? It sounds stupid now that I say it out loud. And she like laughed at me and she's like, I would never go swimming with you ever. And I was like, I, I was like, my, I laughed to my friends, but then I went home and I like cried myself to sleep. And I like, I, in that moment, I was like, I'm not gonna be fat. Like I'm like done, like being overweight. So like for me, it came from like a radical, like I'm not willing to tolerate this life anymore. I don't want to be overweight. I don't like, that's all, That's where it started actually. It wasn't anything else. It was like, I don't want to be overweight. I was like, okay, so this is what I don't want. Um, and I know for a fact I don't want it because it's so painful, it sucks, I hate it. Um, and I'm, I have to go to school and I have to see kids. So if I'm going to go to school and I'm going to see kids, I'm going to do it and I'm going to look good. That was step one. It's like, I didn't want to be like that anymore, you know? And I feel like that's the same for me. What's yeah. interesting is like, I come from a totally different family background. So my parents, like, I never really worried about money. Like, I don't, I think we were more like middle class. Yeah. But my dad was an engineer, worked really hard. And at least my experience growing up was anything that we needed was there. Yeah. And I never really had to struggle with that. So I come from a totally different background. But mental health wise, I was really struggling. Why? I was bullied a lot mm. when I was like in the eighth grade yeah. and in school, like school was really hard. I felt super misunderstood by teachers. I didn't really see the point in being at school. Why do I need to learn these concepts? Like for me, it was just like, I felt like I, there was always a point that I would do a different path. Mm. And I just didn't really buy into the idea that like I had to go to school. Why do I need to be here? What, what's the purpose for it? Mm. My parents, I'm very blessed. were always teaching us to like, be the best you can be, be a good person, try and learn, try and grow, try and like really pursue your potential, be passionate about life. Mm. And so I think that was always like an undercurrent. But for me, I just never felt like I belonged. Mm. And then a lot of my social experience at school was like really intense bullying. Mm. They really hurt. I was rejected by girls all the time, kind of similar to you in that sense. Yeah. And mental health wise, I really reached like a really low point in my life. Mm. And so even though we come from different kind of like family backgrounds, we both reached that point that was the same, mm. which was I'm no longer going to tolerate living a life like this mm -hmm. because I just want something different. Mm. I want something better. I want to improve. Mm. And then personal development was really the catalyst mm -hmm. for us to really start to move forward in, the, in that direction. Mm -hmm. For me, I didn't really know what my goals were at the time other than I know what doesn't work. And it was pretty much everything I was doing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't working out. Yeah. I was staying in my room all day. I was smoking weed. I was playing video games. I never set any goals. Yeah. I wasn't trying to pursue anything in my life. Yeah. Just feeling like a victim. Yeah. I knew that didn't work. And so I was like, all right, what if I tried the opposite? Or what if I tried something different? Mm. Let's see. But it was that decision of like, this is no longer tolerable. Mm. That I think we both came to. And this desire for something better, something different. See, I want to pause there for a second because I think that a lot of people feel this way they're like i don't like the life that i'm currently living but and also they just accept that like i don't like the life i'm currently living and then they're like but it's always been like this it's meant to be this way some people are destined for this life some people are born like lucky and successful and some people are just unlucky and unsuccessful and they just like write themselves off as if they have like no direction or control over like where they go and i think that like Step one for transformation was like recognizing, like if I don't like it, I can change it. And I don't know how to change it. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Like, but it's like knowing that I can. Um, and I think that that is where the passion for personal development came from is like, okay, I can change this. Like, I don't know how, but like I can change this. Cause I think a lot of people never just say, like I could change this, this could, this could be different. Cause they just have never imagined themselves living like any other way. It's like, why does an addict stay an addict to alcohol? It's like, he's never imagined what his life could be like sober. Why do people stay addicted to like substances or gaming? It's like, they just don't imagine what it could be like without it. Right. I think a hundred percent. And 
you know, it reminds me of around the time, like maybe we had parted ways, which you know, there's, there's some backstory to, I had been in a relationship and that relationship ended and I was super depressed about this. And it was really gnarly because so at the time I was, uh, my cousin had, uh, an apartment that I, I went and lived in for a while. And it turned out that my ex-girlfriend who we had just broken up, she was dating a new guy and he lived across the street from me. And so every day when I was walking home, I'd go to his coffee shop to like read. And every day when I'd walk home, I'd see her truck across the street at his house, fucking this guy. Mm. And it crushed me. Mm. Like if I saw her truck there, it was like devastating for me. It was so bad actually that I would usually walk home like staring straight at the ground. Mm. Cause I knew if I didn't see her truck, at least I could kind of be like, uh, maybe, maybe like, maybe mm. she's not there tonight. Mm -hmm. But if I knew she was there, it was like mm. really, really bad and really dark. And I just remember there's this moment where I was in the living room and I looked across the hallway. And I could see the mirror of the bathroom. And I just had this thought that was like, if I could write something on this mirror to remind myself to keep going or like that things could get better or some, some source of hope, like what could I say? And this phrase came to me, which was, if I could, I would. And what this meant to me was, if I could get better, if I could overcome this, if I could become successful, mm. I would, mm. I would choose that. Mm. That's actually what I want. Mm. But right now I feel so much pain mm. that I can't see beyond that. And I just feel like giving up. Mm. I just feel like I can't control it. Mm. But if I could overcome this and be successful, that's what I would choose. Mm. And that began this journey at that time for me of what are the things I could do that would help me feel better? Mm. What are the things I could do that would help me start to improve, start to be successful? Mm. And that was things at the time, just like going to the gym, meditating, reading good books, mm. eventually moving to, to Colorado and finding some space in my life, surrounding myself by better people, mm. having a new goal to pursue. But it started with that decision. Mm. If I could be better, mm. if I could improve, if I could overcome this, mm. I would. And I did want that. Did you, what, did, what were the practical things that you did at that time to overcome that relationship? I, I think the gym was like a huge one. Yeah. For me, like working out, eating good, good, healthy food. Yeah. Those were really, really important. DJing was also a really important piece of, the, of that for me. That gave me like a creative and emotional expression mm. to be able to get stuff out of my system mm. and be able to play. And like when I was playing, I, I didn't really think about things. Mm. It was like, I was able to process my emotions. Mm. Uh, to be honest though, like one of the big things that, that really helped me, I think was I ended up moving. Mm. And I moved at the time from Calgary, which is in Canada, down south to Colorado. Mm. And I remember the first day I arrived there, I'll never forget it because just the relief I felt about being able to go to the grocery store mm. and know I wasn't gonna like run into my ex mm. and see her with this dude gave me this like stability mm. that I could like go to the grocery store. I could leave my house. I could go do other things mm. and just feel safe. Mm. Cause at the time in Calgary, I just didn't feel safe about that. And that really helped a lot. Yeah. Then I was surrounded by a bunch of other people who were trying to pursue their own business, trying to yeah. make an impact on the world. Yeah. You know, that led to things like the Ted talk and things kind of progressed from there. But yeah. I think finding space at the time for me was really important mm. because otherwise I was just constantly anxious everywhere I went that I was going to be hit with this terrible emotion mm. if I ran into them. You know, what's interesting. I feel like this is a, so like if you're not happy with where you're currently at right now and you're like, I'm not satisfied. If you know that for sure, it's like one of the things that you could do is you could look at yourself in the mirror and be like, I'm not willing to tolerate this level anymore. I want to change my life. But some people aren't just don't have that. They just like they've tried, it's failed, hasn't worked, whatever. And so they just don't believe that that flip, that switch could be flipped, which it always can. But some people just don't believe it. I think another way to flip that switch with or without you wanting to is to move to a different city, because I completely agree with that. Because when me and you ended up splitting up and I kind of like went out on my own path, like I'll go into that like briefly. We we worked together for a little bit. I was like 19, 20. I didn't really know what I wanted with my life. And I think that at the time I was struggling with an Adderall addiction. I couldn't communicate that to you. I was like, you were my mentor, but I like couldn't 
tell you that. And so instead of being like, I'm struggling with Adderall addiction, Cam, help. It was like, I need to blame somebody else for this and I need to run. Like that was like the default. So I was like, I needed to peace out. So I literally left because I'm like, I couldn't stop myself from doing Adderall. I couldn't quit my, I like tried to quit myself. It wasn't successful. So I was like hopeless, like in my own like world. And then I was like, okay, I need to, I need to get the fuck out of here. Like I need to go somewhere. I need to do something. Um, so I left, I went to a different city and like going to a new city was really hard because when you're overcoming any sort of addiction, there's like this withdrawal period. I felt like my social skills went, went from like a hundred to zero. Um, I just felt like lost. I was alone. I didn't even know if I was going to make the football team. I was like a walk on tryout. Um, and even though that summer was like filled with like adversity and heartbreak and loneliness, coming back from that summer, I was like the most clear I had ever been in my entire life. Like I just felt like I was like, I, for once I had a sense of purpose just cause I had a little bit of space and clarity, but I felt the same thing. Like for, for me, the environment that I was in when I was in a, in a darker place was no longer, it wasn't serving me. And so getting out was a big part of transformation. I know that you work on that, like with one of your clients too, just like, let's get it, get you out of your environment. I think changing your environment is one of the easiest ways to really start to make a shift in your life. Mm. Now there's a, there's a really key detail here, which, which I want to share because so I ended up moving from Calgary down to Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. And I moved into this house with a, a bunch of other guys who were like passionate about entrepreneurship, passionate about impact, passionate about personal development. And there was one guy I knew there, his name was Phil Drolet. Shout out to Phil, it totally changed my life. But so we just moved in there and the, on the first night we were in the living room kind of talking, Phil and I just like connecting. And he said, all right, man, like I'm gonna go to bed. I was like, all right. And I used to say this thing, you know, you might even remember this back at the house. I used to say this thing before we went to bed, which was, well, we live to fight another day. And so I said this to Phil, I said, all right, man, well, we live to fight another day. And he, he turned to me and he said, no, I'm not taking that belief on. If you think life is a fight, life is a fight. If you think life is a flow, life is a flow. I choose to see life as a flow, so I'm going to bed. And I remember, I'll, like, I'll never forget this. <laughs> I stood there like, all right, man. And then I walked upstairs, I was staying in my friend Cesar's room. And I laid on the bed and I stared at the ceiling all night because I realized like <laughs> I had moved down to Colorado thinking when I arrived in Colorado that I had the victory. Yeah. That things were going to change that like the work was done. Yeah. And what Phil taught me that night, which I I'm forever grateful for was arriving there was the beginning of me having the opportunity to change my life. Uh, I was able to get into the room. I was able to get down to the city. Yeah. But that's when the work actually began. Uh, and to give myself credit, I woke up the next morning. I went to Phil. I said, Hey bro, thank you for what you said last night. I get it. And I immediately started to, you know, there was a course that he had suggested a personal development course. I bought it. I started to go through it. I started to apply it and things started to change. Mm. And so for me, it was so crucial that like changing your environment is one of the hacks. I firmly mm. believe in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But changing your environment, that's when you now have the opportunity to make the change. Mm. And that's when the real work begins. That's funny because I love that. And I also think that that coincides with coaching, that coincides with personal development, that coincides with any, like it coincides with getting a gym membership. Cause like a lot of people, what they'll do is they're like, okay, I need to get in shape. And so they go to the gym, they're like, I'm buying a membership. But it's like buying the membership gives you the permission to start doing the work. Uh, buying the course gives you the permission to start doing the work. Changing your environment gives you the permission to start doing the work. But it's like, at the end of the day, changing your environment is a really good stimuli, but like that's the stimuli that could or should light the spark. So yeah, I completely agree with that. I love that statement. So when you started to get into personal development, like what was your gateway to that? What, like, was it a book? Was it a course? Was it a mentor? Like how, like you, you kind of came to this point where you realized, you know, I'm sick and tired of living the way I am. I want to change. Yeah. What was the, the initial gateway for you? I think fitness was the gateway at first. Like if I think back and like, I actually think about like what started me working on myself was fitness. Cause like when I went from like the moment where I was like, I'm no longer willing to tolerate this to like, I ended up starting to drink more water every day. I started going for a run every day. I like did push-ups every day, like sit-ups in my living room. Like that's how I went from like 165 pounds 
at this, in the start of the summer of grade eight to the start of grade nine, I was 130 pounds. So I remember coming back to school and people like looking at me being like, who's the new kid? And I'm like, I was here last year. I was just fat. You guys didn't notice. So then, but then I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, then it clicked. I was like, okay. And this is cool because back, dude, when I was like 13, 14, 15, like I was like a hardcore gamer. Like I'm talking about like, I don't know if you ever played RuneScape, but I did and I was really good. I got to like level 117. Like I was like, I would skip school, play for 10 hours straight. I'd be at school drawing RuneScape. Like I was like a gangster. And so for the first time in my life, I realized I'm like, like I can play a game or I can play life and like playing life is so much fun because all the hours that I put in developing my skills on RuneScape, like logging, witchcraft, like like defense, offense, all that, I'm like, or I could just be like, gym, exercise, workout, get jacked. I was like, that seems way cooler. So it's fitness. And then fitness was the first skill that I developed where it made me realize I can develop a skill. And then once I developed the skill, then I got into high school and my friend was like, dude, we should join the football team. And I was like, eh, he's like, I'm trying out. He's like my best friend. He's like, I'm trying out. He's like, you should try out. He's like, basically like, don't be a bitch. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. So me and him both went, we tried out for the football team. I was bro, I was like literally the worst kid on the team. Like I like, couldn't catch anything, could hit any, couldn't hit anybody, had no skill. But I learned from this thing over here, losing weight. I was like, I can, if I focus, I can get better at something. So showed up early, you know, was the last person to like leave the field was always asking questions, was studying film in my spare time. In like grade 10, I earned most improved. Grade 11, I was team captain. Grade 12, I took us to city finals as the captain of the team. So it's like, I saw that progression. And then after high school, I was like, okay, like, what do I wanna do? I'm like, I don't know what I wanna do, but I knew that social, social skills were important. And that's where I got connected to you. I was like, I like, I know that if I focus on something, I can get better at it. So like, I need to develop my social skills. I don't exactly know who or where to turn to to do that. I found a guy that was doing it, AKA you. And then I was like, I just need a mentor. And so you ended up asking me to move in with you. And at the time, like, dude, I didn't even make my own bed. Like I didn't like, I was eating cereal out of boxes with my hands. Like I was just a kid, you know, like I was just a kid. I was just a kid. So like, I think that like I, I never had a father figure growing up. Like my dad wasn't around and it wasn't his fault. Like my mom didn't really, me and my mom don't really have the closest relationship. Like she didn't tell my dad she was pregnant with me. He didn't find out about me until he was 26. So like I didn't have somebody around to be like, this is how you shave your face. This is why you need to shower every day. This is how to talk to girls. You know, like I didn't have that. And so for the first time in my life, I like had a male role model that I was like, I want to be like this person. And it just, I think for me, it was like, it started with skill development and then I realized I could develop life skills and then I found you. So I wanna talk about RuneScape. What, what, what was it about RuneScape for you that was so addictive? Cause RuneScape is known as one of the kind of original most addictive games. So yeah. what was it about RuneScape that was so addictive for you? It was the fact that I could, uh, number one, the more that I focused on the game, the better that I got at it. And I have an obsessive level of focus. So when I want something, like I get it. And so when I'm online, I'm like, I can outfocus all these guys. And because I outfocused all of them, I got to the highest level. And because I got to the highest level, every time I played the game, I was like, I was like a goat. Like I'd walk around like this little like online RuneScape worker and be like, oh my God, you're level 117. And I'm like, yeah, I am. Right? Like I felt so cool every time I was playing. Um, so I think that Knowing that I could develop a skill that I was significantly better than everybody else is what made the game addicting. And knowing that like the amount of work that I was putting in was directly proportionate to the result that I was getting was was like why I was playing. That's what made it addicting. It, it's so interesting to me because that's still the core way that you live your life. 100%. Like you'll outfocus everybody, 100%. outwork everybody. 100%. You put like a goal, a target in mind, you pursue it. Yeah. Right? You're still getting a lot of the feedback. Yeah. Right. And a bit of the difference is in a game like RuneScape, you put effort in, you get like rewarded and it's instant. Yeah. In life, you don't really get that reward fitness. You know, you're going to the gym, you're not seeing any progress mm. other than incremental progress a little bit. Yeah. For a few months. Yeah. Right. You're entering a fitness competition. You don't even know if you're going to win mm. until like three, six months later. Mm. Right. So how do you think you were able to make the shift from playing a game like RuneScape and getting all that instant feedback to being able to take that same kind of concept, outwork, outfocus everybody, yeah. be determined, progression, leveling up, all that stuff. 
and apply it in other areas of your life that don't have that instant feedback? Yeah, I think that the, to be completely transparent, I think the first skill that everyone should focus on is fitness because if you think about all the different life skills that you could have, like we're talking about like social skills or business skills, making money online, marketing, relationships, talking to your parents, communicating with like girls, like all the different skills you could develop. All of the things that I just listed don't have a tangible measuring tool, except for business, obviously. Business, is like, it does have a tangible measuring tool. We'll get into that in a sec. But I think fitness has a stick that you can measure. It's like if I'm 130 pounds and I disappear when I turn sideways because I don't lift a weight and I've never touched a dumbbell in my life, like if I do 100 push-ups a day for the next 100 days, there, like you're gonna see the measuring stick move a lot. Like you're gonna see that like progression happen pretty fast. And I think that seeing that progression and realizing that you can make progress is the first step. Because for me, it was like, dude, as soon as I lost the weight, I was like, okay. I'm like, what else can we do? Like, that's where my mind went. But I think that a lot of people try to change your life without tangible measuring tools. And I think whatever you measure is going to improve. And so for me, fitness is always going to be number one. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. That's why I teach personal trainers. That's why it's been like, I've done 10 fitness competitions because I know that there's such a tangible measuring tool. Like if I set a goal and I put in the work, you know, over an extended period of time, my, the result is gonna be that I'll look a certain way or feel a certain way, whatever, and that's gonna give me confidence to do other things. So it's always been fitness first. Um, Cause a lot of skills, like if you think about a game like RuneScape, like if I don't like, cause RuneScape had a bunch of different skills you could practice, you could like log in the forest or whatever. So it's like, if I went logging in the forest and I was level one, I put in like, 30 minutes of work and I'm level two. And then to get to level three, it takes like 45 minutes of work. And to level four, it takes, you know, but you can see the levels progressing. And so if you think about something like social skills, it's like, I can't see my social skills improving. There's no tangible measuring tool. So it's really demotivating. So I think that you need to have something where you can like tangibly see it. And, and hopefully something that you can see like almost instantaneously. So it gives you hope. And when you get hope, then you can be like, okay, like I can keep going. I can keep doing more. Does that make sense? hundred percent. And yeah. I think with fitness, it's like, you can see your strength, right? Obviously yeah. like you'll see your physique improve, but that'll take a bit longer. Yeah. But you can definitely be tracking the outputs as well. Yeah. How many times you've been going to the gym. Yeah. The weights of, of like improving, yeah. your strength improving. Yeah. Right. You feel more energetic. Did you leave the gym feeling like stoked mm. or did you leave feeling super tired? Mm. Like there are some of these things you can measure, but just the weights, alone mm -hmm. are one of the easiest ones mm -hmm. you can really be looking at mm -hmm. so i agree that i think fitness is one of the first ones especially for gamers to really be focusing on because that is a direct correlation between the effort i put in and some sort of tracking or, or measurable outcome mm. that when it comes to games games are very good at giving you that you mm -hmm. have a scoreboard the leaderboard you have rankings you have the progression systems you have all the rewards that come with all your effort and that then gets you very excited to put in that effort mm. because you're getting rewarded. Except it's really for nothing. Mm -hmm. Other than the feeling yeah. of I have been able to do well mm. or I'm really good at this. Mm -hmm. But the tangible benefits in improving your relationships, making you more wealthy, giving you a greater sense of purpose in life, making you happier. Mm. Gaming might temporarily give you some of those feelings, but they're not gonna transform your life in that way other than the 0.0001% of gamers who manage to turn it into a career mm -hmm. of which pretty much everyone listening to this podcast has not turned it into a career. So using that as an argument, I think just doesn't really work very well. Yeah, I, I dude, I think that like the question that people need to be asking themselves that are listening to this podcast is like, how good could your life be if you took all of the energy and all the passion and all the effort you put into gaming into building your life like how good would your life like actually be if you took all of the passion and all the energy and all the intention and all the like direct and like the like focus if you took that you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like it's time to change my life like i'm no longer willing to be this guy anymore i'm like I'm, 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 I'm not happy with the level of success I have. I'm not happy that I live in my parents' basement. I'm not happy that I'm like not doing what I want to do with my life. I'm not happy that I'm working at a job I don't like. I'm not happy with my current situation. Like I'm going to do something to change my life. And you took all of the, like the energy that you put into your excuses and your procrastination and your limiting beliefs. And you just like committed, like 
how good could your life get? And that was the exact question I asked myself. How good could it get? I asked myself if I took 16 hours a day, I was pulling into World of Warcraft to build a hunter that could raid and accomplish certain things and get a bunch of validation. If I took that 16 hours a day and put it into other goals and dreams I had, like what could I achieve? That was the beginning of my journey. Yeah. Now I know so many people listening to this are feeling this way, but there's one big distinction between gaming and real life. In gaming, if you lose, you just press restart, you try again. There's no risk. Whereas in life, you approach that girl, you go for that test, you go for that degree, you're on that sales call for a client and you don't get it, you apply for the job and you don't get it, you feel rejected. You feel like you failed and that hits your ego. Whereas in games, there's no risk. It doesn't matter. It's all virtual anyways. And so the thing that holds a lot of people back from actually treating life like the ultimate video game and really pursuing their life is that it comes with risk because something now is on the line. You know what I think about when, whenever I think about this, I talk to my clients about this all the time because this is something that like comes up frequently is like, how do you get somebody to take action? Because in reality, like, like look at a baby, okay? It's like, look at a baby learning to walk. Like when a baby's learning to walk, how many times does it fall flat on its face? Like over and over and over again. But when we're kids, it's like, we don't view that as a failure. And we're like, oh my, like, you know, it's like if I'm a baby and I'm trying to walk and I fall, I'm not like, oh my God, I'm never going to walk again. I'm just going to sit for here forever. Like, I'm just going to sit here. Like you don't think like that. You just like get up and you try again. But in life, people don't do that because it hits their ego and they're like, well, you know, in life there's more risk and I, I could get rejected if I post on social media, people not, might not like it. If I try to build my own business, I might fail. And you know, if I approach the girl, it might not work. And if I put myself out there, I might get like slammed. And if I try to change my life, I might come back to like my old habits and people think like this, but I have like a little bit of a different approach. And I'm like, you don't in like video games, you get a press reset in life. You don't get a press reset which means that when your life's done, it's over. Like it's actually over. And then that's it. Like you don't get to try again. You don't get to, you know, you don't get to go for your dreams. You don't get to go for your goals. You don't get to take care of your mom who's been taking care of you. You don't get to, you don't get another chance. And so for me, it's like knowing that you only get one shot and that you don't get a press reset. Why would you not give it your all while you still have an opportunity to like breathe? Like, why would you not try? And of course, when you try, it's going to come with failure. It's going to come with rejection. It's going to come with like, because it's like you don't get it just like, well, I'm just going to use my life like an, another life in my game. Like you don't get that. But it's like that pain is part of what makes life worth it, because when the rewards come and they will, you will make more money. You will get more jacked. You will find the girl like when they come. It's just that much sweeter because you know what it took to actually get there. And I think that's the beginning of finding your purpose mm. is I'm committed to finding a way instead of finding a way that, oh, oh it's not going to work. Mm. It's like, yeah, maybe that way won't work. And so you try something else. Can I ask you a serious question? When you wrote your suicide note, what made you decide not to do it? So the, so there's a, been a couple different times in my life I've written a note. And so I, I want to share a couple of them. So the first time I wrote this note, you know, I, I was like having dinner and I wrote this note on my computer to 12 people in my life who meant something to me. This was the, the original one. And I got a text from a friend named Ainsley and she said, Hey Cam, a couple friends and I are going to go see the movie super bad tonight. Do you want to come? And I said, yeah, sure. Like, let's, let's do it. And so we went to that movie. We hot boxed the car before we went, we went in. I'm not advocating for this, just being real about what happened. And if anyone remembers that movie, it was a really funny comedy, mm. right? There was a character, McLovin. And I just remember like being in that movie, going from writing the suicide note over dinner to smiling and laughing with a group of friends at a movie theater. There was a moment where like I zoomed out and, and I could see my life from a third perspective. And in that moment, I realized how serious my situation was. Mm. Cause I wasn't just like thinking about suicide, struggling with it. I was seriously planning to follow through with it that night. And that scared the shit out of me because I realized I was a danger to myself and I realized I need to ask for help. And my dad's always told me like, if you ever need something, you come to me. And so that night when I got home from the theater, I said, dad, I need to talk to you. And he came down. I said, I need to find a counselor. 
I need I need help. And that began that journey of turning mm. things around. Mm. One thing the counselor did just quickly was he held me accountable. Mm. So I had to get and keep a job. Mm. My first meeting with him, I went back for the second one. And he said, did you get a job? I said, yep, I got a job at Mex for any Canadians who, who might remember that clothing store. And he said, did you go? And I said, nah. He said, next time you have to go. You have to get a job and you have to keep it. And so I got a job at H&M yeah. at the retail store. And I actually missed 22 out of my first 27 shifts. The only reason I wasn't fired, I think, was divine intervention. The manager would always say, you didn't come. What's going on? And I was like, I was going through a lot, trying to change. But like, I was throwing up in the shower before work was what was happening. Mm. I was just so anxious having panic attacks. But they stuck by me, stuck by me, stuck by me. And eventually I figured it out. The last time I wrote a suicide note, I think I was maybe 20, I was around 29. It was just before my 30th birthday. And I was just feeling a lot of pain in my life again. And I just felt like I just couldn't do it anymore. And so I actually sat at train tracks in my car for about three hours, thinking about whether or not I should get out and, and actually like do this. And friends were calling me being like, you know, trying to talk to me, trying to like connect with me and I wouldn't pick up my phone. And then eventually I got out of the car, felt, like got a bit of space from like the, the the environment and felt a bit better but something a friend told me was suicide would always be a trigger for me if it wasn't if it was actually an option in my life and so the reason i kept being triggered and thinking that i would follow through with it was because there was actually a part of me that thought i would actually do it one day and and what he suggested and i understand for some people they might think this was harsh of my friend to say, but I really think it was the, the thing he said to me that changed my life, honestly. But he said, it can no longer be an option. And so that night I wrote a letter to my mom that said something along the lines of, I, I will never take that action. Mm -hmm. Suicide will no longer be an option for me in my life because of the pain I know it would bring my mom. Mm -hmm. Because the first time I said I was suicidal in my life, I was in the sixth grade. Mm. And I said it because I wanted to get out of detention. The teacher had said, you have detention. I said, well, I won't be here tomorrow for it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to kill myself. And of course he was alarmed. Yeah. And I ended up in the counselor's office. I knew this was a mistake. Because yeah. now I was like being held hostage you know, yeah. by the school. Yeah. I was just trying to get out of detention. And my parents came in and I remember my mom looking at me like with like so much pain in her eyes saying, how, how could you feel that way? And the pain in my mom's eyes, every single time I've been at that darkest point in my life, mm -hmm. the thing that's always kept me there was the pain in my mom's eyes that one time. Mm -hmm. Cause I knew that it would be devastating for them mm -hmm. and they, they would never recover. And that's the thing that really has kept me alive it's powerful so i think that uh that's like i think there's people listening to this right now that needed to hear that because it's like when you're thinking about i'm not fucking satisfied with where i'm currently at that can't be an option and like staying the same also can't be an option because you know where that leads it doesn't lead anywhere and so like let's find a better path like let's do something different like let's work on ourselves. it's very powerful I 100% agree. I, I think we come from different backgrounds. We've had different paths. We've achieved different things in our life. But the common thread is a decision that the current situation we were in could no longer be the future situation. And we had different goals. We had different ambitions. You know, the path has been wildly different. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of ups and downs along the way, mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. for both of us. But there's always been a North Star, which is improving our life and being willing to, to take the action to make it happen. When you talk about like video games, I think that I do view life as a video game in this sense, like uh, in the sense that I believe there's, you know, four different areas of your life that you could work on. Like if you think about RuneScape, how you can do log logging or magic or, you know, gardening or whatever the skills are. I think in life, it's you've got your health, you've got wealth, you've got relationships and you've got self. And health goals are like, I want to get jacked. I want to look good. I want to have a six pack or I want to feel good mentally. And wealth goals are like, I want to drive this type of car, live in this type of house, you know, make this much money, you know, I run this type of business. Um, and then relationship goals are like, I want to meet my dream partner. I want to be surrounded by good people. I want to be, 
you know, around people that inspire me. And then self goals are just goals that you have for yourself that have nothing to do with anything. Like I want to get a tattoo on my body because I like tattoos. I think they're badass. And so like health, wealth, relationships, and self are like the four areas of my life that I view as like, I gamify. And when I mean I gamify them, I'm like that, this is the vision. These are the areas of my life that I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to take all of my energy and all my effort that I was wasting on my potential. And I'm going to pour it into these four different areas. And so for like every, every day, I'm trying to advance these skills because the more time that I put into these skills, the better that I'm going to get. And I try to find tools that I can measure my progress in. So in fitness, it's like, I know that if I, like, if I have a six pack, that's an indicator that my fitness is on point. When my six pack goes away, that's an indicator that I'm eating too much pizza. So like I use those like benchmarks, I guess you could say like measuring tools to measure how well I'm doing in my uh, health. And then with my wealth, it's like, well, I'm, you know, now I drive a Lamborghini, which is awesome. I'm really grateful for that. So I'm like, I drive a Lamborghini. So like, that's an indicator that my wealth is going really well. I use these measuring tools. Like I've got a gym, I got a 20,000 square foot gym. I've got a house. like, these are indicators that my wealth is going well. Um, relationships, it's like me and Kirsten are in the best place ever. Me and you are in this house renting this Airbnb on the top of a mountain. It's beautiful. So like the, our, my relationships are solid. I'm like, I'm good with my relationships and myself. Like I look at myself in the mirror and I'm just proud of myself. Like I'm proud of the person that I am. So it's like, I view life as a video game. And I think that there's four different areas of your life that you can level up. It's like health, wealth, relationships, and self. And like, I just pour my energy every single day and trying to advance these skills just a little bit more. And I think there are two key ideas here that are really crucial. The first is you've let go of all the stuff in the past, the current situation that you're at. You've let go of the things that have led you to that path mm. and said, look, that hasn't worked. Let's let it go and let's find something that will work for us to move forward, mm. right? And then you've actually had a North Star of where you're looking to go and you've been accountable for it. Because mm -hmm. I know something you're a big believer in and same for me is taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the life that you're living, you are responsible for. Mm -hmm. And otherwise you're a victim. You were rejected, you were bullied, you were fat, you came from a family that didn't have a lot of money. It would have been very easy for you to play victim. You were at a point where you didn't have the results you want. Would have been very easy for you to play victim. Can I be honest? I did play victim. Exactly. For a long time. So when did that change? How did you like stop playing victim and, and do that while taking full responsibility for the results that are creating in your life? And, and had that be such a core tenant of who you are today? Oh, dude, that's a deep, that's a deep question. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a deep question. That's what we want. Right? That's a deep question. How do you like, how did I, when did I stop playing the victim? Like when I stopped blaming my mom for kicking me out when I was eight, you know, when I stopped blaming you for my, my own addiction, uh, when I stopped blaming everybody other than the person that was looking back at me in the mirror, when I stopped blaming my dad for not being around, like when I just like realized it was a Will Smith quote, actually. Will Smith says, like, there's a difference between fault and responsibility. Like, it might not be your fault that your dad left you or your mom abused you or you were born in a trailer park or you had all these adverse circumstances. Like, your dad wasn't around or he was around and he beat you. Like, that might not be your fault. He's like, but it's definitely your responsibility to do something with it. And m most of my life, bro, I played the blame game. I would say like, that's something that I still struggle with to this day in the sense that I catch myself in those behaviors and I have to be like, nope, where am I, you know, how am I responsible here? Because I think it's almost like a default human reaction when something happens to us, we wanna like, well, well like we wanna like absolve ourselves. We wanna be like, I, like, I'm not responsible here, but it's like, I try to accept full responsibility for like, literally everything like in my business like if somebody in my company makes a mistake i'm like i literally will send a client a message i'm like i'm sorry that's my bad i'm the one that hired the person that did the thing it's totally my bad it's like somebody makes a mistake at the gym like it's not this person's fault it's my bad for like not training this person properly like i take full responsibility for literally everything and so i think that it's like it started when i stopped blaming people in my past for what was going on and one of the things you said is you're like, you had to let go of all the things that you used to know that made you who you are. Like, dude, like, you know how hard that is? That's like releasing your identity. That's like letting go of like literally who you believe that you are. 
And that, and the reason that's so hard for people to walk through that door is because as soon as you accept responsibility for the fact that you're in full control of your life and you're the one driving your ship, that means every excuse that you've ever made for not living up to your full potential was a lie. And that's a really, really hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. But a necessary one. A necessary one. And that's where real transformation actually happens. Yeah. And you know, to go back to that story with Phil in, in the kitchen, we lived to fight another day. He directly said to me, yo, I don't live my life like that. And I'm choosing not to live my life like that. And that confronted me. Cause in that moment I thought, oh, I'm just making this cheeky little remark that I used to say to everybody all the time thinking I was funny. And then I realized I was playing victim. Mm. Life is so hard. Poor me. Mm. Life is like all about suffering. Yeah. And in that moment I had to choose like, am I going to actually step forward and start to find flow in my life too? Mm. Am I going to start to find purpose in my life? Am I going to come to Boulder and actually move forward mm. or Am I going to just say, ah, it was too hard. It didn't work out. It's another struggle. Exactly. Yeah. And I think something you said to a friend the other day was you don't have problems. You have solutions. I think that's a really powerful statement. That's, uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes is whatever you're find, whatever you're looking for, you're going to find whatever you're looking for. And so if you're looking for all the reasons that it can't work or that you're going to fail or that it's not like, it's not possible or like, it's like, like it just won't happen when you're looking for those reasons, you'll find them. And I know that because I was that dude. Like, I know what it feels like to struggle for money. I know what it feels like to not have things. I know what it feels like to like not be successful. And like now in the last, like, dude, in the last 12 years since we met, like I'm, I've achieved, you know, million dollar years. I achieved a million dollar month, like I'm making a million dollars in 30 days. And I never would have done that if I wasn't looking for how to make that happen. But it's like, I don't look for things that aren't working, I almost try not to even talk about them. I only look for like ways that I can win and I'm only looking for opportunities and I'm only looking for like areas that I can improve and get better and grow. And like, even when I see a problem that's like in my business or my life or my relationships, I view this as an opportunity for me to work on this and become a better person, a better version of myself, a higher level version of me. Like I want to grow through the adversity. And it's the same thing when you talked about like earlier, you were like, people are afraid of rejection, right? Rejection is actually a good thing because it gives you a direct mirror on like what you need to work on. So if you walk up to a girl and she says like, she laughs in your face, there's probably a reason. And so you could be like, I suck, I'm the worst, like what was me? Or you could be like, okay, maybe she doesn't wanna date me because I've been living in my parents' basement for the last 10 years. Or maybe she doesn't wanna date me because like, look at me, I'm overweight. Okay, and now like, what am I gonna do with that? Well, I don't wanna be overweight. Okay, so what am I going to do about that? Let's do something about it. Let's go for a walk. And like, that's where it starts, you know? So it's like, I view every adversity as an opportunity. That's where it starts. And that's the process that goes on infinitely. You were just sharing that you still have to catch yourself when you play victim. 100%. For me too. I still have to catch myself when I'm in that space. There are still points in my life where even with where I am now, I realize, all right, what sort of limiting beliefs do I have about myself? still mm -hmm. what limiting beliefs do i have about myself that are keeping me from reaching that next level mm -hmm. and in order for me to go from where i am now to like the next point in my life that i want to get to i have to reevaluate my identity mm -hmm. i have to reevaluate my beliefs i have mm -hmm. to reevaluate the actions i'm taking i have to reevaluate who i'm surrounding myself by mm -hmm. because what got you here is not going to get you there for people listening who might feel like you have to make a decision now that's the same decision you have to continue to make mm -hmm. as you go forward in your life. Mm. It's learning the process that that's the dance of life. You're going to face adversity. You're going to get feedback that it's not working. Yeah. And that's the same process of having to overcome it that you have to take to actually get to that next level. And you just repeat that over and over and over and over and over. For us now, it's been you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years. Mm. But that's still the same process that we have to go through. So it's not something that you only do one time. Mm. It's a skill. It's a process that you learn to nurture mm -hmm. and you learn to develop. You might catch yourself playing victim. All right, you got to correct yourself, mm -hmm. right? And that's the same thing you have to do now, even mm. if you've reached a certain level of success. Dude, I think, and that's, we talked about this the other day. That's why it's so important to be surrounded by the right people because the right people, like, like me and my wife have a beautiful relationship because if I'm complaining too much, she'll be like, 
yo, like, listen to yourself. It's the same thing with me. It's like, if she's like gossiping too much, I'm like, do we really want to be talking about other people when they're not in the room? It's like, we hold each other accountable. And I think it's the same thing with like my friend's circle. It's like my business partner, me and Cole, like if there's something going wrong in the business, like I'll call him and then I'll vent. And then he's like, you done? I'm like, yep, that's all I needed. And then we're done. And then we move on and we don't talk about it because it's like, it is a constant process of, you know, on the path and then all of a sudden, you know, you do something that causes you to lose momentum and you have to like, and you fall down and then you get in your head and you like start playing victim and then you have to pick yourself back up. And it's like, when you're around other people that are committed to living in that vibration, like Phil was for you, it makes it easier to stay there because then you're not on an island. You're not like doing it by yourself. And like the hard part about that is that when you're the type of person that make like it plays a victim, plays blame, like doesn't surround themselves with positive people, is negative, the hard part about that is everyone in your life will typically also be negative because that's who you are. And we t tend to attract who we are, which is why I think it's so important to have mentors. Like it's important to have friends and it's also important to have mentors. Like, and my definition of a mentor is like, this is a person that has character traits, qualities or skills or outcomes that I want to develop in my life. And for me at the time, I remember when I found you, I was like, he's got the social skills. He's got the status I'm looking for. I'm gonna learn from this guy. And then I just found you and then I learned from you. So I think that it's important, like, that's why environment's everything, because it is hard and you need to catch yourself over and over and over again. And part of that's all ultimately about, I wanna I want talk about overcoming limiting beliefs, because that's something that I know you help your clients with. Yeah. I know that's something that like, you're a strong believer in your process with. Yeah. And so what's your process to overcome limiting beliefs in your life? It's, it's, that's a funny question, because like, if I asked you what your limiting beliefs are, you're like, you don't know that's why it's a limit right so it's like it's almost like it's hard to know my one of my favorite quotes is it's hard to diagnose the prescription from inside the bottle or i can't solve a problem in the same mind that created it and so step number one is becoming aware and so like awareness and like i think that like this is like a really interesting conversation because i think even before you be you can become aware you need to realize that your mind is a uh, moldable substance, which means that at any point, you know, if I don't know how to use a typewriter, at any point, if I really wanted to, I could sit down, I could move my fingers, I could train my brain, and eventually, like, I would, I could, I could typewrite, right? Eventually, I would figure it out, as long as I kept myself in the game. And I think that many people view their minds not as a plastic and moldable substance but as a well i've always been this way so i will always be this way and because they have these neurons that are firing like this is how it's always been and it will always be this way they don't realize like oh it could be different and i could change my beliefs if i tried so i think before you can change your limiting beliefs you need to become aware of the fact that like you could change them if you wanted to like you said at the start of this podcast if i could i would it's like if you wanted to you could change them. A lot of people like to fight for the limitations. So they're like, no, you don't understand. It's always been this way. And you don't understand what I've been through. You don't know how hard it's been for me, right? And listen, if you're having a hard time, I understand. But the first thing is to like become aware that you could change. Like if you wanted to change your uh, beliefs and like your perception of the world, you could. Okay, so that's step one. I think step number two is awareness of the limiting belief. And like, I don't know, I don't know how else you can get aware of a limiting belief other than uh, you know, some becoming aware of the things that you say, which is really hard when you're first getting started to like become aware of your own language. I think you need to have a mentor or a friend that can call you on it. Cause when you have a mentor, like as an example, Phil, for you, like you said something and then he's like, that's a belief I'm not willing to accept. That was him holding up a mirror to a limitation that you had. And then at that point, once you become aware of the limiting belief, then you need to be like, okay, like this is a belief that is causing me to stay in the struggle. So I need to do something about that. And for me, like when I, when I find myself like, uh, with the limiting belief, like I'll attack it, like I attack it. And so if I'm like, oh, this is a limiting belief that's like holding me back. Like I will go full speed at it. And so when me and you first got together and I didn't have social skills, I was like, I don't know how to talk to people. So I was like, I'm gonna attack this limiting belief. So I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna force myself to talk to 10 people every day, five days a week, 365 days a year. And that's how I attacked it. It's like, I am not willing to accept this. If I have this limit, limiting belief, that like I'm overweight. 
I'm overweight and it's always gonna be like this. I'm like, that's not true. I don't wanna accept that. I'm gonna attack that. I'm gonna go to the gym five times a week. I'm gonna get on my diet. I'm gonna like get on my meal plan. I'm gonna attack it. And so the way that I approach, and this might not work for everybody, but like you asked me how I approach limiting beliefs is like, first you need to become aware that your brain is a plastic and moldable substance and it's not concrete. Second, you need to become aware of the limiting belief, aware of the limiting belief, whatever it is. And then third, for me, I think you need to attack it. Like, I'm not going to accept this. Like, this is not a reality I'm going to accept. I'm going to go all in. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. And, you know, another one that a friend had brought to my attention, I guess, like maybe two years ago now, was he brought up the phrase, like, are you allergic to money? Mm. Because for me, I felt like I had reached such a high level of success in my career. I reached, you know, as an expert on the topic and in the field, you know, I had certainly done that, traveled all over the world, spoke everywhere, you know, the media, all that stuff. And yet I could still barely afford my rent. And I remember saying something along the lines of like, man, I work so hard. I've worked so hard for years, like 10 plus years, wake up every day, work super hard, put in hours, all this stuff. Yet my bank account did not reflect that. Mm. And he would always give me like what he'd ask me what my to-do list was. And then he would look at it and say, well, that's obvious why you're not making any money. And he'd give me a different to-do list to do. And of course I would be super resistant to this <laughs> and never do any of it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> never do any of yeah. it. And he'd always be like, bro, are you allergic to money? Yeah. And it was this phrase where it was, it made me kind of think like, wait, like what is going on here? Yeah. And yeah. it brought that same awareness yeah, yeah, yeah. in the same way. Phil was like, bro, like, life is not a fight yeah life is not a struggle yeah. life is a flow yeah yeah and then that gave me an opportunity to start to mm. like attack it mm. now part of the way i've attacked it at times is finding a new belief and replacing it with that so instead of my life is so depressed right now i need to end my life it was if i could get better i would mm. and since that's what i actually want how do i actually get better mm. And that put me on a path of what are the things I can do, even just from a scientific perspective, mm. what have we learned that can help us feel better, feel less depressed, feel happier in mm. our life. I think mentorship is something that like you continue to show mm -hmm. at every stage of your life, even back when you were a teenager to now is something you're constantly reinvesting in, seeking out, mm -hmm. finding, and that's a huge part of what's helped you become successful. Mm -hmm. I've seen that example. I'm investing in myself way more than I ever have mm -hmm. from that example, mm -hmm. right? So I think someone bringing that awareness to you mm -hmm. of where are you holding yourself back? I realized I only ever prioritized having my own business from a location and time freedom perspective. Mm -hmm. I never had the idea of, oh, as an entrepreneur, I'm also going to be successful mm -hmm. financially mm -hmm. and be able to stay in a villa like this. Mm -hmm or drive a car like you have, mm. or just have the kind of financial freedom mm. that I really aspire for. Mm. And so I think having people bring that awareness to you mm. is key. For me, it's also been replacing it mm. with a new belief mm. that I can start to focus on and attack. Mm. I love that, I love that. And I also think that there's something else to be touched on in there is like, even your friend being around you being like, bro, you're allergic to money, it's not just, the things that he said but correct me if i'm wrong but it's also like the person that he is well he he was someone who like we started at different points i i started years before him and then within like three years he was way beyond what i was doing and it made me really question like what is he doing different mm. and why is he seeing that success and i'm not mm. and that also you know i was telling you about this a bit that like it put a bit of fear in me mm. that my buddy, my best friend was going to end up just outgrowing me mm. and that I was going to be left behind. And it was because I wasn't living in full alignment with mm. my full potential. Mm. And there were a lot of ways that I was accepting and settling for mediocrity in my life. Mm. I tell my clients this, that two years ago, I wouldn't have woke up at 6 a.m. every single day mm. to be on coaching calls at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I wasn't willing to do that. Mm. Okay, I would do eight. Yeah. I was willing to wake up and like do a call at eight, mm -hmm. but that's nine o'clock Eastern, which means most clients aren't available. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I'm willing to wake up at six. Where's the difference between you and me? You're waking up at four, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're waking up at four. Mm -hmm. And that's like a no questions asked this whole week. You've been here. We've been staying together. Bro, you've been up. Don't miss. 
right? You don't miss. Yeah. And what do I get to see? Mm. I get to see the level. Right? I get to see the commitment. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly like what I need to see. Because mm. it reflects for me, Not it's not about the time. Yeah. It's about the level of commitment. Yeah. Right? And I get to see, all right, what's the difference between your level of commitment and my level of commitment? And that then reflects and gives me a visual mm. and, and kind of an example of, all right, now how do I attack that? Mm -hmm. And bro, I promise you from this week, I told you yesterday, there's going to come a day where I hit you up and I say, bro, from that week, here's the progress I made mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because what I needed was to see it. Mm. Right. Yeah. Because I know, cool. I know you since you were like 17 years old Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. seeing you now. Yeah. For me, super inspiring. Cool. I'm super proud of you. Thank you. And back at 17, there was no doubt in my mind that this is where you would get. You know, it's funny. You were the, I told uh, Chris this before we came here. I was like, you were the first person that ever told me that I was going to be bigger than Tony Robbins. You remember telling me that? Yeah. You're the first person that ever told me that. And like, I do for like, that stuck with me for like, I'm going to get emotional. It stuck with me for a long time. And to this day, like, if you look at my vision board, I'm like, bro, I'm going to be bigger than Gary Vaynerchuk. Like, I'm like the next guy. And that belief started with you. Because you always said like you've got something like you're gonna be you're gonna be something big and I, so I believe that you like I appreciate that and I like I want to touch on something you said because I never really thought about it until you positioned it the way that you did um, but yeah so if you look, if you look at my week all week even the night we got in like we got in at like ten we stayed up till eleven thirty catching up bro I was up at four o'clock and I had sales calls from five a.m. to eleven a.m. back to 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 back, to back. and I did that all week and. For me, missing isn't an option. It's like, I would rather jump off that cliff than cancel a sales call. Like that to me is the level of commitment. And if that means I need to get no sleep, I'll do that. But it's funny because me and you also, I remember there was one night where we wrote an entire book for, uh, for Kingpin back in the day and we did stay up all night. We got no sleep, we got a photo. But it's like, that to me is like, I, re uh, I remember hearing a concept from one of our old business partners back when we used to work together and i think this has stuck with me my whole life and this is one of the this is one of the things i like hold close to my chest and i use as i would say a cheat code for life because when i used to play video games i used to look up cheat codes this is my cheat code is i look at what everybody else is willing to do and i do like just a little bit more because i know that like that little bit more might not seem like a lot right now but when you add that little bit more and you times that by 10 years, by 20 years, that makes a difference between the people that you like remember forever and the people that get forgotten. And it's like, dude, I'm like, it's like that little bit more is like, I've been doing that 4 a.m. thing for like the last like three years. It's like, I do five podcasts every week for free. I do way more of that. Like I post three times a day on my Instagram. I don't miss three times a week on my YouTube and like, Right now, the Instagram is growing, which is I'm super grateful. But like, dude, I've been posting on YouTube three to five to seven times a week for the last three and a half years with no payoff. There's like no videos that have gone viral. But I know, I'm like, I know for a fact that I'm just gonna keep putting in the work. And one day when it hits, and people are gonna be like, oh my god, like you're so inspiring. Like, how did you become so successful? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, because I have 2.5 thousand videos on my YouTube channel. So it's like, I figure out what everybody else is willing to do and I do just a little bit more. And it was this, the concept of the slight edge from when we first got together. Yeah. Which is still one of the best concepts, one of the concepts for me that is still so crucial is just 1% better every day. And the key idea here that I wanna kinda use to kinda tie in everything we've been talking about today is one of the unfair advantages that you can have over everybody else. So what everybody else is willing to do, but you're willing to do a little bit more, one of those key concepts is to not quit. Mm -hmm. If you think about so many businesses fail, so many people mm -hmm. fail to be able to be successful, so many people try so many different things. People here listening to this are like, well, I've tried this, I've tried to improve that, I've tried to pursue this goal and it didn't work out and so that's why I'm staying where I am. If you just commit to improving your life and pursuing goals and working on it and you refuse to quit, that alone could be the thing that over enough time mm gets you the breakthrough eventually. Mm. And I know for you with YouTube, like obviously I've been following that journey. Everyone who's watching this on YouTube, definitely go follow Brian. You know, he puts out awesome content and you know, I follow a lot of it. When I started YouTube, I said, I would put out two videos a week, every single week for three years. 
before I ever even evaluated whether or not mm. that was worth it mm. or whether or not it was successful. Mm. And you know, YouTube for me has definitely been like some highs and lows and like lots of ups and downs, but now it's all right, let's keep working at it. Let's mm. keep trying to find the way to make it happen. And as long as you just don't quit and you mm. keep learning, you keep growing, you keep taking action, mm. success is inevitable, especially when everyone else is going to be willing to quit. Mm -hmm. If you just keep going, you mm. can succeed. I love that. I love that. I agree. So give us like a bit of, give us a bit of insight into like where you are now. Like what have you like been able to accomplish? Mm. What goals have you been able to accomplish? And, and what's kind of like the next vision? Where mm. are you going from here? Well, to like kind of wrap this up and kind of tie this all together. If you would have asked me when I was, I always knew, I used to, when we worked together, I always had these like, I always knew I had unlimited potential. I just didn't know what that meant. Um, and so to think back on my life when I was 19, 20, first started working on myself. If you would have asked me like, if I actually thought I was gonna be a millionaire, I might've like, like might've said yes, just to appease or try to look cool. But like, I did not believe that. Like even a little bit. So in the last like five years, in the last 10 years, I started an online fitness coaching business. I got that business to, you know, there's eight people working for me. We worked with over a thousand clients. I realized I had a passion for business. We were making high six figures a year. So I was like, I'm going to teach other people the skill that I developed by starting this coaching business. So I started business coaching for online personal trainers. Um, when I started business coaching for online trainers back in 2018, it was just an idea. Uh, me and my business partner, Cole De Silva, started this company called PT Domination. Um, in the last, it's almost been six years now. In the last six years, we've worked with over 5,000 coaches. I think we're getting close to 6,000 at this point. Um, we've made over $20 million in, in sales and revenue. Um, you know, with that financial success, you know, I've bought my dream car, Lamborghini. I have a beautiful mansion in Kelowna, BC. Um, I'm married to my dream partner. We got married two years ago. We're planning to have kids soon. Uh, I own a mansion in the Dominican Republic, uh, the 20,000 square foot gym that I own in Kelowna, BC. And those are like the, you know, the financial wins, which I'm super proud of. But like fitness wise, like I've done fit 10 fitness competitions in the last like five, six, seven years. And I've won some of those because I'm a gangster. Um, but I think the biggest thing, dude, like the biggest accomplishment that I honestly have more than anything is like, Every time I look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, I'm, I'm proud of you, you know? And like every time I go to bed and I lay my head on the pillow, somebody like messaged me on Instagram the other day and they're like, you look tired. I'm like, I am tired. Like going after your goals is not easy. It's like, but like that is the mindset that I, that I have. And like, I just like, I'm so proud of the work that I put in literally every single day. It's like, I'm proud of that dude. So that's where I'm at, bro. Yeah, and for me, like seeing you now, you know, I've said this to you a couple of times, but you know, meeting you when you were like 17, 18, 19, and seeing you now, so much of like who you are is still who you are at its core. But the difference now is like, I've got to see you grow up mm. and become a mature man and become a leader and, and become that person that like was always so obviously there, but just mm. was really struggling to stop self-sabotaging, mm. actually believe in themselves, overcome addiction, and be able to actually step into their full power. Mm. And so for me, being able to see you this week and spend this week together has been super special. Yeah. And also I'm just so grateful that you made the effort to come out here. Cause it yeah. would have been really easy for you to be like, ah, I'm in Bali. Like we got this plan for this month. And I, I was like hoping for sure. I think I had like planned to message you and be like, Hey man, like you're so close. Like, you know, we should do something. Yeah. But you actually even messaged me first and said, Hey bro, like I'm going to come over. I want to see you. It's been so long. And yeah, 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 like, yeah. I'm just super grateful for the effort. Cause yeah. I know, taking a couple days just to fly over and like yeah. all the effort that that took yeah yeah but it means a lot to me and like this week's been super special and yeah i'm really glad that we got to sit down and have this conversation me too bro i feel the exact same way so where can people follow you like where can people get in contact with you i'll put all the links in the description but yeah. just for audio yeah i think that if you're listening to this and you um if you're trying to start a business go follow me at the real brian mark on instagram because <laughs> there's lots of stuff there uh if you want more like lifestyle slash like like day in my lifestyle content, uh, go find me on YouTube at Brian Mark. And then uh, if you like listening to podcasts, you can find me at the Change Lives Make Money Online Trainer Podcast. And I'm gonna put this on mine as well. So where do people find you? So gamecores.com for any gamers or families out there struggling with gaming or problems around gaming. You can follow me on Instagram at Cameron Dare and on YouTube, Game Quitters on YouTube. Cool. Bro, thanks for having me. This was great. Thanks for having me, man. All right, bro. Talk to you soon.